Having laid all the groundwork now for how to look at, uh, to address a communication system, and in particular, what kind of optimality we will be using and how to use signal space analysis, it's now time to dive into the question of modulation. So let's start with a little uh, motivation. Why are there so many modulation formats? We'll be discussing um, phase shift keying, frequency shift keying, amplitude shift keying, quadrature amplitude modulation. So there's lots of reasons for these different kinds of modulation formats. And that is because of the very great variety of communications problems that exist. As I may have mentioned earlier, if I have a system which is super cheap, I want to have a garage door opener. So, you know, something that has very easy communications, open close, maybe a little bit of a code so I don't open my neighbors. You know, the, the data rate is very low, but the cost must be super low. If I have communication systems between two satellites, uh, if I have communication systems between a ground uh, radar and a um, space probe, if I have communication systems ship to ship, all these different kinds of scenarios where we require really good communications, they're all going to require a uh, different trade-off of the three important uh, quantities uh, to examine in a communication system. So I've uh, said the most important criteria are spectral efficiency and power efficiency and power efficiency, uh, it's bit error rate versus signal to noise ratio, which we, we mean by power efficiency and the complexity or the cost. So each one of these scenarios is going to have a different mix of what is tolerable uh, for all these three criteria. And so as I try to achieve the sweet spot of the balance between these three criteria, I need to have the tools to reach those goals. And those tools are many different modulation formats, and that's what we'll be covering now. So there are two types of uh, detectors that we'll be examining. Uh, so the classification goes between uh, coherent detection and non-coherent detection. So let me first explain uh, the difference between these two. And be careful because sometimes the vocabulary, vocabulary in the literature can vary a little bit from uh, textbook to textbook, from uh, paper to paper. But when I talk about coherent detection, what I mean by it is that the phase of the carrier is known to the receiver. Okay, so there is a um, m many, let me say most communications involve the use of a carrier. A carrier is a frequency. Um, that we use to shift the communications. So uh, one option would be baseband signaling. And in baseband signaling, if I were to look in the frequency domain, then the communications signal would be in baseband. It would have its uh, centered on uh, frequency equals zero. But in passband, or, or I could say with a carrier, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to shift that same spectrum to some other uh, center frequency. So I have some nominal center frequency, and instead of having that being a DC, I move it over. And we call this the carrier frequency. So there's many reasons why we'd want to use a carrier. Um, antenna size is one reason for using a carrier. Um, another one is to just be able to uh, exploit many frequencies. So I can move one over to here, I can move one over here, move one over here, etc. So many reasons why I'd want to use a carrier. So when I use a carrier, what does that mean? Well that means that I have an oscillator somewhere and it is basically um, doing a modulation, which means multiplying my signal by this carrier frequency. So there may be a phase offset to this uh, uh, oscillator. And what we're assuming in coherent detection is that whatever that offset is in the carrier frequency, or the carrier, um, in the carrier, I assume that I know it for coherent detection. And so if you think back to complexity, it's probably a little bit more complex to have knowledge of this phase. Well, in coherent detection, the optimal receiver is going to be a correlator, which we've seen earlier, the correlator structure, and the noise statistics are Gaussian. So this is pretty much what we've been looking at in my introduction to the background needed to address modulation. 
But there's also a second kind of demodulation or detection that we can use, and that is called non-coherent detection. And in non-coherent detection, you know, I have this carrier, but I, I'm going to be able to complete reception, do good detection, even though I don't have knowledge. It's just unknown to me what this phase is for the carrier. So um, think of it as being some like plus theta, some, some carrier that's unknown. So in the case of non-coherent detection, we assume there's a theta that isn't known. And in the case of coherent detection, we assume we know the theta. And when we know the theta, then we typically take it to be equal to zero. Now, <laughs> when, I have to, when I'm confronted with non-coherent detection, the correlator structure is not going to work. And so I have to go to something that is a uh, power detection or an envelope detection, which is going to let me uh, be able to recover data despite the fact that this phase is unknown to me. And in this case, the, the noise is actually non-Gaussian. So this is one of the few instances in this class where we'll be discussing non-Gaussian noise. But we'll go over it very briefly. So modulation is a very large topic for this class, and this module three on modulation is going to be quite long. And so I'm dividing it into two parts. And in the first part, uh, basically we'll be discussing the bit error rate versus signal to noise ratio, or the power efficiency, and also the uh, cost complexity uh, part of the balance. So we're going to look at different modulation formats. First I'll tell you what modulation formats are. And then we'll look in particular to develop equations for the bit error rate versus signal to noise ratio and to appreciate the difference in cost complexity. Uh, then in, that's all in part one. In part two, we'll look at the spectral efficiency of these um, different modulation formats. So this would be part two, and this would be part one. So part one is already uh, lengthy. Uh, so we'll start, like I said, we'll look at modulation formats, and then we'll look at what the receiver structures look like, how they vary depending on the uh, different modulations we'll, we'll look at. After we have the uh, receiver structures, we'll go on to the probability of error to assess the uh, performance of these different modulation formats. And we'll do that for coherent detection first, and then we'll go on to do that for non-coherent detection. And then finally, we'll have a little discussion of, of gray codes uh, when uh, the time arises. So there's going, as I mentioned, this is going to be a lengthy uh, module, and so I'd like to also discuss uh, different ways that we're going to attack the problem. We can look at the binary case. And we can go look at the m -ary case, when there are an alphabet larger than two. Um, we'll see, uh, we'll start with the binary case because it's easier. And we'll look at signal space. And we'll, uh, we'll talk again about normalization. So I talked about normalization the first time I introduced the concept of signal space, when we looked at on-off keying and antipodal keying. Um, and we talked about the distance between two bits and how that influenced the probability of error. Now we're going to have to do that same kind of attack, but for the m -ary, uh case. And uh, instead of being just the um, distance, one distance between two bits, things are going to be more complex because we're going to have distance between multiple symbols in a constellation. So just recall that when we looked at the binary version, we had on-off keying and BPSK. We had the, over here we had the signal space representation. So there were just two uh, waveforms, so two uh, symbol vectors. Uh, here's the uh, vectors for on-off keying, one vector is just the origin, and here are the two vectors for antipodal or by uh, BPSK. And uh, again, it was the distance between them, the separation between these two, which entered into the equations for the probability of error. So this is the approach for the binary, and now we're going to have to apply that or, or extend that to the m -ary case. Uh, remember that when we compared these two binaries, uh, we saw that the um, bit error rate curve, which is a waterfall curve, and we saw that the on-off keying was worse. It's farther from the origin, so we know it's worse performance than the BPSK, and in fact we were able to quantify that as being a 3 dB uh, difference. So uh, this is the binary case, and how do we attack extending this to the m case?